today. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what you had in mind, so I brought two uh, of my important staff people with me. Kent Cottle was in the back there. He oversees all of our inspection and maintenance for our Salt Lake office. And Dennis Orgel, he's our safety guy. And also he, he interfaces with the, the insurance people and anytime there's problems or claims, either one of these guys can help with anything we have. Um, and I'll tell you that the previous speaker, boy, he done a wonderful job segueing into some of what we see all, all the time. Um, you know what, I always say in our business, it's like selling ice to an Eskimo being a sprinkler contractor because we, we sell a product that, you know, first of all, the owner does not want in their building. They have that uh, moving mentality. They think once the head goes off, they all go off. And, you know, while there are systems like that, it's not, not the common thing. It's usually a wet system. You know, second of all is, you know, we hope like hell you never have to use our system, quite honestly, because if you're using it, there's a problem within the facility. But third and most important is when it needs to be used, it better perform as it was designed to perform. And the best way for that to ensure that that happens is the proper inspection and maintenance on the sprinkler systems. And I, I think the last speaker showed very well what happens when that doesn't occur. So with that being said, we'll segue into this. Now, beforehand, let me just say that um, anytime you have a question or a comment, raise your hand. You know, I, I, I want to have questions as we go, as opposed to wait till the very end, because often you get, you get going, and by the time we get to the end, you forget what you're even going to ask. So, you know, you won't bother me at all by, by doing that. And second, from some of these presentations I've been to, you know, you walk away after the fact and you go, boy, I, I remember him talking about something, but I'm not quite sure what it was. So I tried to put on each of the, the slides either a, you know, website you can go to or, or explain some of it in red right on the slide, some important things. So down the road, and I understand that you're going to get a PDF copy of this. So, you know, down the road, you can look at it. Maybe it'll jog your memory on, on things. So... With that, we'll proceed a bit here. Now, you know, it's often said, you've got a sprinkler system. Why do we have that sprinkler system in? And it, it's really quite easy. I mean, there's, there's national codes and state codes that dictate when sprinklers are going to be installed in buildings. As you see, both uh, this is the 2015 International Building Code and Fire Code. Unfortunately, the state right now is on the 2012 code, and we're in the process, and I sit on a code analysis council, and we're right now in the process of reviewing the changes between the 2015 and 2012. So there may be some changes coming up, but be aware that you know we're on the 2012 code. And the IBC is really for building inspectors, when a building's built, it, it's for new construction because they they tell you, you know, wall types and height limitations and everything. So that's for new construction for the most part. The fire code, and again, we're, we're still on the 2012, that's what the fire departments like to see. That deals with not only new construction, it deals with existing buildings. So... The fire department lives by that Bible there. And so, with that being said, the state of Utah, under this statute, has decided that they review both the 2012 IBC and IFC, and there are certain specific sections of each that they take an exception to and maybe modify. Uh, you know, keep in mind these are national codes, and, and Utah's adopted what is best for them. Most of the counties go along with that. So that's the three main bodies that we deal with on when sprinkler systems are installed. Now, once they are installed, we have specific standards and, and that we have to deal with on the inspection and maintenance. One of them for the piping in any water-based system 
is NFP, NFPA 25. The state is on the 2011 edition, but if you ask the state fire marshal, he thinks it's a 2008. Um, but we are, it's actually the 2011 being enforced right now. Seems like a minor thing right now, but later on as we go through this presentation, you'll understand why it's important that we do that. Uh, NFPA 72 deals with the electrical detection part of systems. Uh, Pre-action systems, deluge systems, and so on, actually have a separate detection part of that system, and that's what you, know, you have to look at there for the electrical part of those systems. Uh, now, here is the NFPA 25, there's a link to it. Again, that, that's what we live in and go by in the state here. And, um, you know, so if anyone says that, you know, they're doing a proper inspection for you, make sure that they're enforcing and going by this standard. Now, this standard assumes that the system, once it's installed, was de installed correctly for the code it was under. So it, it's kind of a, a nebulous area there. We can be inspecting a system that was installed in the 80s, 90s, still inspect by the NFPA 25 for 2011, but you don't have to bring it up to any code standards because the assumption by 25 is it was accepted you know, at the time it was installed, so it was correct. A lot of inspectors sometimes will, will try and say, well, you're too far off a, a wall with this head or something like that. That's really not the intent of the inspection part. You have to assume, unless that wall was added later, that that system was correct when it was installed. Um, okay, again, Utah has some, you know, rules that they want to add above and beyond. And one of the rules I think is really good, and the fact is Kent, myself, actually was part of the State Fire Marshal's Task Force back in 2003 on this. Uh, we have set standards for people that are authorized to do inspections and testing on wet water-based fire systems. That's the rule there. You can go to the website and get that if you'd like. But the state also has further rules just beyond sprinkler systems, uh, the 007 is fire suppression system, which is mainly, you know, hood systems, uh, energy systems, FN200 systems, the old Halon systems. That's the requirements for doing any work on those systems. I'm sure some of you have those in your facilities, so they fall under different rules. That's why I'm kind of bringing this as an overview for you. Okay, the 009 is the rules pertinent to the Fire Prevention Safety Act. That's what actually gives the state fire marshal and the local fire marshals authority within the state of Utah. So that's where a fire marshal can come into a facility and demand it to have an inspection. You know, that, that's right in their rule section. Uh, the O11, they've done the same thing, similar to what they did with the water-based systems with fire alarms. So that's a totally different rule that you have to follow, but you have to have certified people in situations there. Okay, now who is really responsible in NFPA 25, section 411, very clearly states the property owner or his designated representative shall be responsible for properly maintaining the water-based fire system. I don't know if you can really see this picture here too much, but that's the school that actually had turned off the heat over winter recess and found out that that wasn't really a good idea with the wet system to turn off their heat. Then uh, a lot of major damage, as you can see there. That being said, uh, under 4.11, it's the building owner shall ensure all areas of the building containing water-filled piping shall be maintained at a minimum of 40 degrees Fahrenheit and not exposed to freezing. There is systems out there, dry systems for instance, that you can have below zero. 
They're not concerned with that. They're very concerned here. I hope I get this pointer working right here. Oop, went the wrong way. Excuse me. Well, they're, I guess I'm not getting the pointer to work. But, uh, they're, they're concerned about the 40 degrees on water systems. Um, and I'm sure some of you have heard about antifreeze being the solution. We'll talk about that a little further on. It's really not anymore. Okay. Now this section out of uh, NFPA 25 1.11 references us back to the 72 for the, the detection part of pre-action and deluge systems. One thing you want to make sure of, and there's companies out there, and we run into it all the time, that uh, you go in and do an inspection and they'll say, well, it's already been done. We had an alarm company here last week. That alarm company only did the alarm portion of that possibly. They did not do the entire system. We ran into that numerous times where an owner thinks that he's covered, he's really not. So be aware of that, that there is some companies out there doing that. And, you know, NFPA defines what's expected of the owners to provide a reasonable degree of fire <coughs> protection for life and property from fire through minimum inspections, testing, and maintenance. Uh, that's a picture of a valve there, and I don't know if you can see all the corrosion in, inside of it there, but that, if I hit it again, sorry about that. That valve would likely not operate in the event of a fire. Just hadn't been maintained, bottom line. All right, and they go on to say, the reasonable degree is achieved through proper and regular excuse me, regularly scheduled visual inspections, testing and maintenance per table 5.1.12 of 25. The standard states that those inspections are visual from the floor and they don't require removing ceiling tiles or going into the attic. Some inspectors actually in big higher facilities will carry binoculars with them. That way they can look up and see the sprinkler heads, see if there's corrosion on them, see if there's anything with hangers or something that would indicate a possible problem. Okay, this is that table, and as part of this, I've sent over, and I hope you'll be able to, to get copies of all these inspection forms. They're standard right out of NFPA 25, and they break this down pretty clear into three sections. This is what's required for inspections. Here's the testing requirements. And here's the maintenance requirements of all the water-based systems. And you can see, for instance, here on gauges, they should be looked at on a pre-action and deluge system weekly or monthly. But those same gauges on a wet system only have to be looked at monthly. So, you know, I would recommend that you follow these and, you know, they would help you immensely on these here. The, the valve, valve components and trim shall be inspected, tested, and maintained for table 13112. This table requires both an external and an internal inspection of the valves. Uh, I've seen some of our competitors tell customers that you don't have to do an internal inspection. And, you know, very clearly all they're doing is uh, what we call in the, the business is rag tagging. And they're not doing you as a customer any, any favors at all. They're charging you just to come in and sign a tag and put it on your riser. So be cautious of that. Here again, the same area is broken down. Here's what's required for inspections. Here's testing. Look at that pipe right there, which was pulled out of a local hospital here. I won't mention which hospital, but obviously if you think that that system would work, you know, I wouldn't feel safe being in that hospital myself. Here's the maintenance part of what's required right here. Tells you annually, quarterly, three years, five years. Again, that pipe right there come out of a local children's hospital. 
So if my child was in the hospital, I want to make sure. Yes, sir. Is that rust in there or is that other trees? That's a combination of that. Uh, it could be rust. Uh, they, they have what they call MIC that's out right now. It's a, a microbe that's actually attacking the internal walls of the piping and you may get pinhole leaks. If you're starting to get pinhole leaks in systems, it's probably a MIC issue. You know, so that picture there shows the pipe that looks good up there. Right. That's what I'm saying. And until you break it, you won't see it. Right. And, and there is requirements that, uh, you know, every five years we actually have to pull the end cap off the main and the sprinkler head out off the line and investigate to see if there is any debris. If there is, we have to do further investigation, uh, possibly flushing the entire system. And, I mean, we've actually had to remove entire systems before because certain areas with certain water, it's really got bad. Uh, you know, over the years, and it, it's funny, I've been doing this now for 38 years. When I started, it was all Schedule 40 pipe, thicker wall, you know, heavy pipe. Nowadays, it's Schedule 10 piping, lighter piping. Uh, the MIG problem actually is worse on that than it is the heavier wall pipe. In addition, uh, they've gone away from as much chlorine in water as they used to. So they're not killing that bacteria like they used to in the past, so it's still allowing it to survive. And, you know, the sprinkler system, the wet system, is totally stagnant once that system filled up. So it, it's going to, you know, occur in there quite often. And we've got systems out there 50 years old that are still in great shape, and some have been installed in five years. We already have Nick problems. so great question. All right. Here is the internal inspection, and this is what I was talking about just previously. Uh, we have to conduct it every five years by opening the end of a main flushing connection and pulling one sprinkler on that branch line. So, you know, yes? Is that a big problem? Do you treat that locally, or is that something? Uh, there is some things now that you can uh, put a solution within the piping that may you know, prevent that. Uh, some of the pipe manufacturers have got an internal coating thinking that's going to help, but I, I think it's going to become a bigger issue as time goes on. Great question. Okay, uh, like I mentioned before, NFPA 25 gives us the frequently, frequency of the inspections, and the R7105 tells us who can perform each inspection within the state of Utah. And the state allows the owner or designated representative to complete daily, weekly, monthly, or semi-annual inspections. So you don't need to be certified in that. But in order to do an annual three or five years, you must be certified. There's actually four different certifications within the state. A tech level one is can do certifications on wet and antifreeze and standpipe systems only. Part of that certification is, is a, a written test that you have to take at the state fire marshal's office and have verification you know, that you've done these in the past. Uh, when that was initially set up, it was set up as a closed book test. Um, some of the school districts and uh, cities and counties wanted their own maintenance personnel to be able to do that. So, you know, being involved in the political arena, they changed it to an open book test. And so there is people within, you know, counties, cities that are certified in different levels. That's one additional reason why there's different technician levels here. You go to a tech level two, that guy has to pass everything as far as the tech level one, plus take that written test on dry deluge pre-action, combined, systems, fire pumps, and water tanks. And level three is, he has to pass everything to level one and two, plus he has to do the written test on water spray systems, foam water systems. Those are specialized systems. You'll see them in uh, uh, power plants. You'll see them at refineries. Aircraft hangers have foam systems. They definitely want people knowledgeable on those type of systems because if you dump a, foam, a high expansion foam system by accident, 
you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars there, plus the potential for damage of any aircraft and so forth. So they want to make sure that, you know, you know what you're doing. And then the master technician was kind of a compromise for people coming from out of state. Uh, they have a, a NICE certification program, which is the National Institute for Certified Technicians. And they have a testing program for water-based systems. And the state felt if you had a level three in that regard, you, you could come into the state and, and get, by reciprocity, if you will, the master technician level here. So that's the, the reasoning behind that. Now, when you look at this here, this is a head right here. This is a concealed sprinkler head. The cover's been knocked off of. Going through and doing weekly inspections. Yes, sir. I have one of those in my tail, <laughs> and the reason that that is off, it's like that, and and we've got it back on, but, but uh, it's in concrete. That head is buried in concrete there, and so in order to get to it, to get that other cover to put on it, they didn't quite bring the sprinkler down far enough to screw that on, and so it's a difficult. The prisoners like to mess with that too. They do. <laughs> yeah. The fact is, they have special heads for. Four gels. And they'll fill your room up really fast. Yeah, yeah they will. <laughs> but but they'll only set one off once because once they do it, uh, you know, it's kind of obvious who was who it was that did it. Yeah. Well, the sheriff asked me how do you stop that, and I said you just take a, a towel and stuff under the door, and let that room fill up with the problems. Yeah, I, I often say they ought to put them in small deluge systems, and whenever they have a riot, they just turn it on and we'll calm them all down. <laughs> All right, uh, now again, if you're doing the daily, weekly, or monthly, you can have either the certified technician come in and do that. And there are some companies initially, they want to do it all in-house. And I believe what the, the previous speaker mentioned, he's now using independent third parties. And, and I argued with the fire marshal when they set that up, to have the local guys do it. It's kind of like having the fox watch the, you know, in-house here. I mean, if you really, truly want an independent inspection on it, that's what you should do. You know, and here's the building owner or designated representative can do the daily, weekly, or monthly. I don't know if you can see this, but right there, that's a freestanding fire department connection. And I'm sure that that fire department connection was installed when there was no trees there. And I know that the fire department wouldn't be able, first of all, they probably wouldn't find it in the event of a fire. Second of all, I don't think they'd take the time down, or to take the time to cut trees down to get to it. So, you know, in essence, you're just tying the arm of the fire department at that point. So, anytime you see something like that, and I mean, this section is very clear that you have that tree should be removed. So. Okay, on annual three-year and five-year inspections, they have to be done by a certified technician. And this was a rock we found in the dry pipe valve during the internal inspection of this. And I'm just amazed at how close that rock fits right in there, you know? And could anybody tell me, could a, a tech level one do this internal inspection? The answer is no. It would have to be a tech level two because it's a dry system. So if you had a tech level one trying to say he's doing an inspection on a dry system, he's exceeding by state rule his authority on that. And here we have another example here, and I could not believe when I saw this picture, but that's a wooden stake that's right through the butterfly valve. They couldn't figure why they couldn't get the system to shut off. And I mean, pretty obvious why it wouldn't shut off. So, you know, it, and if underground was probably flush correct and everything when it was installed, but over time, you know, uh, in time something's open and closed, water's flowing, it's picking up whatever debris in there, and that just happened to get lodged in that valve. So, you know. Here's an example of the inspection form. Like I say, you should have these for your use here. But uh, 
by the International Fire Code, you are required as a building owner to have all inspection and maintenance records available on site for a minimum of three years. The fire marshal comes in, one of the first things he's going to ask you is, let me see your maintenance records. So, you know, what we do as a company, we've kind of got away from putting them on, leaving them on the site. We supply the owner PDF copies of everything, let them put them there on site because they have a tendency to walk away or something, but the owners ask us more often than not to, to give them the PDFs for their records. Uh, that way they can have a copy on site. Oftentimes they have uh, corporate headquarters or someplace they want to also have a copy in, so we, we're finding that works quite well. Again, you can see it's really broke down into sections here. Here's general section, pretty easy questions, you know, yes, no, is the building sprinklered, are the valves seat sealed, locked, or with a tap or switch, you know, quite generic, here's a wet system asking, you know, is it hydraulically calculated, the dry system, it's talking about is the, you know, the room heated and so forth, so, pretty easy information here. Here's one I would definitely recommend if you have your own maintenance personnel doing weekly and monthly inspections is keeping this form right by the risers because it, it, it just real, excuse me, real easy it tells the valves who it was that looked at it, whether the sprinklers looked all right, the valves and the pressure on the gauges here. Again, you know, it doesn't take much to get in the habit of doing this, and it, it's very easy once you get going. Because, you know, the worst thing is, like the, the previous presenters, to have that system not operate. Here's an example of a, a, a standard wet system. And again, this is breaking it into monthly, quarterly inspections about the fire department, the control valves, the alarm valve. This valve, you can tell by a riser assembly, you can tell by, here's the control valves. There's one above and one below here. That yellow indicator there, that's a visual indicator that you should be able to tell just by looking at it, that system's on. Because that is parallel with the pipe. If that yellow indicator was perpendicular, it would tell you that paddle inside is shut. So all, all sprinkler systems have indicating valves, and they can't close any faster than five seconds. The reason being is they want you to avoid water hammer on the system. It's not like a standard culinary system that water is usually flowing all the time. These systems are usually stagnant. So they want to make sure that you can't close it down too quick and cause problems. But in addition, you can, you know, quickly see that the gauges are indicating approximately the same pressures. I know you can't really read it from there, but you know, if you get that bottom gauge shut down and the top gauge would uh, have pressure locked in it because of the check valve part of this, it would give you an indication that your water supply is shut off. You wouldn't believe the amount of times we've gone out to do an inspection and found the water supply. They paved the road out the street, for instance, the year before. Well, they've gone over the control valve, paved over it. No, no one knows where it's at, but it shut off. So little things like that you really have to pay attention to. Here's a dry riser. And on this one, you really can't see too much from this angle, but that valve is closed. So you can see that the pressure on here is actually off. Uh, I think at this point we was actually out doing an inspection, that's why that valve was turned off. But, uh, you know, again, we a number of times got onto a job site and found that those are closed. And quite, you know, it's laid out in the same format. Here's your monthly inspections, your quarterly, and it, it up here it's telling you, or is it a monthly, quarterly, annual, three or five year inspection? Generic form here. Fire pumps. Um, basically, two separate types of fire pumps here. This top one being a, a vertical turbine diesel pump. This actually is built on top of a 
this house is built on top of an underground storage tank. So that's pulling water out with the diesel pump itself. This is a horizontal split case pump. This is an electric pump here. Both of these are quite common in buildings. Um, not so much in Utah, but other parts of the country. One of the advantages of Utah is we have a, these high mountains around and we have a lot of water pressure. So while we do have quite a few fire pumps, we don't have the number that other parts of the country do. But here again, it's broken up and just pretty standard, easy to follow things. You know, this is generic, so it's got both the diesel and the electric requirements in it. That's why you have a yes, no, or NA. And, you know, your, your personnel can do those weekly ones, monthly, no problem with those. Here's an example of a, a deluge or pre-action. Again, you can see that the valve is open on that. And, you know, the system looks pretty good shape here right now. It's sitting on top of a strainer. This valve here is what they call an OS and Y valve. That valve is closed. And the reason that valve is closed right there is this type of system. That's a flushing valve. This being a straightener here it has per perforations in it. This is where it picks up the debris. So every so often you have to flush that straightener out, make sure everything's out of it. That's why it's closed because normally you don't want that operating. But again, we're, we're back to the monthly, quarterly inspections on these. On these type of systems, you also have the requirement for the NFPA 72, the alarm detection part of that. These two systems have a separate detection part. The old, uh, you know, what I call the Hollywood movies where all the heads go off at once, that's a deluge system. You know, you'll see that mainly in you know, high-risk areas, aircraft hangers around uh, transformers and power plants and so forth. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. Two wet risers right here. You can see the one on the left. We can see visually from the outside it's clean. The valves are open. The gauges are up. The one on the right, you can see, has been leaking externally for quite some time. You can also see down here that gauge, that valve is shut off, and both gauges are reading zero. Don't know how long that system was like that when we showed up to do an inspection on it, but obviously there was a problem. That system was, yes, sir. Well, I'm just going to make another comment about the, uh, on that one, it looks like the valve for the drain is doing on that system. The one on that is automatic rather than the valve itself. But, we had a problem in our jail where the prisoners let off one of these uh, fire scene broke it in the jail cell. And it's come down, we didn't have drains in our cells. Mm -hmm. And so we had water coming down the uh, stairway and everywhere else. But uh, what would have helped, the jail, this was at 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning. And they went, hey, the jailer went out just to do that, shut the water off. The water still comes in the building and you got still got a lot of damage that can happen. How do you know that there's a drain there that you can open up and take a lot of that water away? Uh, it would have helped our situation. Yeah. So there is a drain on those. And tech, uh, yeah, right there is a drain. That's the main drain right there. Right. So, and this one, is, it's back behind you. You really can't see it that well from the, the angle of the picture, but it's there. Right, but you can minimize your damage. You it's can. Except for our uh, 911 system, the water. Yep. So when I got the we were able to open it up and get out of that water, it would have been pretty serious. I don't know. Yeah, so, it, and just keep in mind if you have a two or three story building that occurs on the first floor, everything above is going to drain out of that head unless you, you open those drains. That's a good point. Thank you. All right. Uh, back to this. Uh, like I said, the one on the right here is what we call a red tag system. And we'll discuss that a little further. That's part of the requirements of the state here. Uh, I wanted to show you some examples of sprinkler heads and their improper use or these heads need to be replaced. This one up here, for the life of me, I can't figure why they used the sprinkler head as an explosion-proof plug on an electrical device. 
<laughs> yeah. I, that, I, I guess the maintenance guy was pretty ingenious on that, but uh, I mean, that, that definitely doesn't meet the intent of what the sprinkler is intended for, and it doesn't meet the electrical code either one. <laughs> This, this head right here, you can see all the green and blue on that. That head, all the corrosion, that head needs to be replaced. That's a time bomb waiting to go off right there. So, then, and this one here, I get a kick out of. That, that's a bathroom strap. Is the only thing I can equate it to wrapped around that sprinkler head. I don't know if they're trying to keep the head warm trying to keep it away from that duct or exactly what they're doing that may have been rattling at one time. But first of all, the head doesn't meet the code requirement because of the discharge blockage right there. But then to wrap that around is, is really funny. This one here, that head has been painted. And code very specific says painted heads have to be replaced. Reason being, these heads are designed to go off at specific temperatures. You put paint on those, that's another insulation layer that would impede the, that head may never go off or it would uh, not operate in the time that it's supposed to when you have a larger fire. Okay, here's some examples of water gauges and per 5.3.21 of NFPA 25, a gauge should be replaced every five years or sent back in and certified and recalibrated. It's cheaper to replace a gauge than it is to have it recalibrated because we have to send it into the manufacturer. So you, I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but right here on this gauge is 1959. You know, that, that gauge definitely needs to be replaced. I'm sure it's older than most of you in here. Unfortunately, I, I'm older than that one. This one, that year is right here, 2011. So that one's coming up where it'll have to be replaced. But uh, I just want to ask, if anyone in any of your facilities has a gauge back from the 50s or older, let me know, I'll come replace it free. Because uh, I have a collection of these. I, I have some of these going back to the 30s. So. It, here's some common things on fire department connections. Now they can either be located on the, the building itself. Uh, the one on the right is a dry standpipe system. You can see that it, it tells you right here what they are. This tells you it's an automatic sprinkler system. Uh, a flush mount versus an exposed dry system or, or exposed connection. One of the things we find is problems is most of these are made out of brass. And we find that people steal these cats and everything else and sell them. We, we've even found that they actually cut the fire department connection right off the wall and take the whole connection, not just the cats. So by all means, look at those on a weekly basis. Here's some freestanding fire department connections. Now, you can see these have what we call Knox cats. The only way to get those off is the fire department has a key that will fit, that they can take them off. That's a deterrent to keep people from sealing. You can see this one, the new brass versus the old brass. Someone's taking part of that off there. The only reason and the chains for these caps are hanging loose, they were probably attached like these. They couldn't get the cap off to start with. So they just took the outer part and they had to do that to replace that. One interesting note on the freestanding fire department connections, Ken has kept careful eye whenever we do a, a five year test on these because every five years we want to actually put water through these. We've had a hundred percent failure rate on freestanding fire department connections. So my concern is you have a firefighter but now has a false sense of security that he's going to be able to pump into that, and that system's not going to work for him. So I recommend that you have wall-mounted fire department connections. You know, there's some 
argument that you can put these, you know, 40 or 60 feet away from the building and, you know, it's easier for the fire department. The problem is they're not maintained and tested all the time and that underground pipe is normally dry and if it's ran in duct wire or, or C900, those gaskets dry out and the minute you hit them again, you're blowing them apart. So, you know, personal recommendation, go with wall mounting. And we can also find them totally hidden from view. And like we talked earlier, this is not uh, acceptable. This is the same freestanding FTC with the tree. But on this one, there's a wall mounted that says auto sprinkler right there. And, you know, they've done a beautiful job of landscaping that. But that landscape over time has grown over that FTC, so they never know what was there. Now, systems are also required to have various types of signs on them. Uh, here's an example of an antifreeze system. Uh, antifreeze were quite common in, in buildings in this area up until recently. Uh, NFPA, actually, there was a death in Truckee, California, because antifreeze is the combustible liquid in a fire suppression system. Sounds strange. But for years, they were done just on small loading docks, grocery stores, and, and receiving areas. Uh, in the last 10, 15 years, residential systems and, and apartment complexes are now required to be sprinklered, but were never sprinklered in the past. And they put antifreeze. We've seen 1,500 gallon antifreeze systems. And because of that, when these go off, you know, there, there's potential for, like I say, Truckee, California, there was one person died. Out here in Harriman, there was a fire at the Farm Gate Apartments. Uh, mother and her young son, young son playing with matches, head right above him went off, and uh, from what I understand, they were burned, and you know, one fireman told me, he says, the best I can equate to that is I was in Vietnam, and it looked like napalm. He says, so, you know, NFPA now says any new systems, you cannot use antifreeze unless it's with an approved solution. Currently there is none. Doesn't look like there will be any. And as a matter of fact, they're saying that by September of 2022, all existing systems will have to be replaced with either a list of antifreeze, which like I say, none, none is out there, or they're gonna have to go with alternative ways of doing it, either insulation, heat, tape, dry systems, systems already installed, they're not going to be able to do that. But the state of Utah has taken, from what I say, kind of like the ostrich with its head in the sand approach. They're still allowing new systems to be up to 150 gallons of antifreeze using premiums. The problem with that is we're seeing contractors out there stack 10 150 gallon systems off of one manifold for one building. So I think we're doing the, the end user, the owners, a big disservice. Uh, houses, for instance, they're going to have to disclose that they have antifreeze in it and sell the house. So you're going to have a buyer that's not going to buy it unless it's changed, and an existing owner that's going to be upset about it. So, you know, watch that. You guys may have antifreeze in, in your facilities. 2022 is going to be changed. Here's some additional signs. Uh, the top general information sign has not been in as a requirement for that many years, but it's extremely helpful, especially in the high pile storage application. Some big warehouses now, you know, storage height has gone up, building height has gone up. So this sign is very good to have. You know exactly what it was designed for. Bottom sign is what we call a hydraulic calculated sticker. That's required to be on any hydraulically calculated system. And I would say from 1980 forward, the majority of systems are hydraulically calculated. Before that, they had what they call pipe schedule systems, which so many heads were required on certain size pipe, two heads is one inch pipe, three heads with inch and a quarter. Those things have gone by the wayside and we still run into them occasionally. 
but uh, just be aware that it, they're out there. The hydraulic signs tell you exactly what the system was designed at, the pressure at the base of the riser. When you do an inspection, you see the hydraulic says you had to have 60 pounds at the base of the riser, and you only have 30 pounds on your gauge. Right away, you know you have some potential problems. Here's, uh, you know, they come in various companies have different layouts and different types on them. There's just two of them. But, you know, they basically have the same information, the year the system was installed, what it was designed for, pressure requirements. So we're getting calls quite often that, hey, come and look at our riser. We see no hydraulic sign. Can you help us with that? And about the only way we can help if you don't have the original design drawings is we'll have to go back in and do a risk analysis assessment actually calculate it for you. You know, and insurance companies uh, are getting more apt to do that. So uh, from the, the public, I, I understand you guys are all county stuff, but the general public, we're finding that's more and more of a problem. This is the inspection pad itself that's required to be on there annually. Now, part of the requirements of that is that tag must have that state fire marshal seal on it. And as you can see by this, here's the signature of the inspector, his technician certification number, and he's punched out. Here's the date, you know, the month and year, and it was inspected. It wasn't installed, means the original installation and if he just done maintenance on it, he may tag both inspected and maintenance if he does them both at the same time. Quite often on the back of these tags, depending on the individual inspector, he may write the results of a two-inch main drain. He may write the results of what he finds with these antifreeze tests. So, you know, get in the habit of looking at the back of these two. They're, they're a valuable tool. This is what we call the red tag system. And this is required by the state when we find that a system fails to meet the minimum requirements of NFPA 25 to ensure a reasonable degree of protection for life and property. Once an inspector places this tag, you as an owner cannot remove it. There's only two people that can remove that tag once he places that. It's either himself or the fire official. And so they, the fire marshal is telling me that they have issued fines for owners removing this tag. Don't do it. This, this system here was actually red tagged. I don't know if you can see from there, but it's because the alarms were not hooked up and functioning. Doesn't do you a bit of good to have a, a wet system and have the alarm part of it out because you're not going to have a bell, you're not going to have notification to anyone. And if I recall the previous, you know, presenter, I think that was part of the problems that they had is, you know, they didn't get that early notification. So you want to make sure that that system is going to work. In addition, down here, you also would put a, a thing for others that painted sprinkler heads. And the only reason you put that on there is that's really not something we will red tag the system for unless a majority of the, the heads are actually painted, but one or two will usually tell a maintenance guy, hey, replace these heads or, or we'll do it for you. You know, we do it, it just obviously is going to cost a little more. But. And here's the ways we do testing the systems. Uh, right here, this gentleman's doing a, a standpipe test on top of a building. And yes, we do flow on top of a building. You'd be surprised at the number of the, the drain systems we find on high-rise buildings are plugged when you start putting water there, or they're separated. So, you know, it's a good indication, but it's a bad way to find out that your drainage system isn't working when we're flowing 500 to 1,000 gallons a minute on top of a, a roof. Uh, this one here makes me laugh here. But we've got the FDC in the main drain, in addition to all the vegetation right here. I mean, you've got all these gas lines right there. And we see this quite common, but do you really think a fire guy's going to go hook up to that with that gas line right there? I don't think he wants to be 
anywhere near that. You know, that's one of their pet peeves all the time, they tell me. Here's a full discharge system here on a transformer. Yes, we can put water on a transformer and it doesn't blow up. And I had electrical guys out to, to a power plant tell me one time he didn't want to put water on a transformer. And I said, kind of amazing. You must live in an area where it doesn't rain then, huh? This is because nothing more than a big rainstorm. So. Uh, the one on the left here is testing the fire pumps. And quite often we find fire pumps over a period of time, you know, they don't operate near as well as they used to, or, you know, they may have a rock and an impeller or something, or a valve can be partially closed. You know, it's very rare that we do a, an inspection, and Kent's back here smiling, but he, he's always telling me, well, I can't get this thing to work right. And we found some of the dangerous things in, in casings of pumps and valves. So. And again, with the hydrants on the right here, we test the hydrants, make sure they work. Uh, we did one power plant here in Utah, and we found over 15 fire hydrants were not in operation. Kind of a scary thought for me, knowing that they go to the expense of putting these things in, and then they're not even, they wouldn't even be able to use them, so. And it's required that valves be accessible. And I get a kick out of the one on the left here is, you know, when the system was installed initially, I'm sure they were accessible. Over a period of time, they'd done a remodel and contractor thought, well, we'll cover those uh, ugly valves up to the owner and make it a nice wall. The only problem is it made it so nice that we could drain the systems or anything else. Yes? There's also another scenario with that, too. When contractors come in, you have to have a firewall. And so you've got a fire problem with the wall being exposed for the air that goes through there to source out of the roof. So they have to require to put a firewall on there. But then when they open it up like that so they get the valves, then the firewall is gone. So right. Well, if it was originally built, that firewall should have been an issue that was taken care of at that time. That's right. Yep. Yeah, 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 and we we see all the time where they go in and add walls, and add mezzanines, and offices and warehouses, and you know, actually, I think they ended up putting some access doors in these so you know they could get them in, you know, where they could get to them in the down the road. And here again, here's beautiful fire department connection you can't see right there. Here's some. I wanted to show you some examples of what we find is good when we pull the flushing connections off of some systems and bad. You can see, you know, the system on the right obviously is plugged up with stuff. The one on the left, actually it was installed before the one on the right, but uh, been maintained properly and it still looks in good shape. And when we do the internal inspections on valves, some customers want to do their, their cleaning and maintenance themselves. And if that's what you prefer, we can do that. But, you know, I, I just recommend that if we're there with our professional guys, just have us do the cleaning at that point in time. Uh, this is before and after on the clapper right there after we've cleaned it. You know, the top one's a, a small check valve clapper. We replaced the gasket. You can see the strainer on the bottom. It's pretty well plugged up on the left. Again, we clean it, make sure it's operating correctly before we leave the site for it. This one I have to really laugh at. This is just about the end here. I call this our ultimate drive out. We got called out by a customer one time. He was a trucking company and they couldn't make their drive system operate. Well, we went out and uh, found that, I guess one of their maintenance guys got tired of maybe the system false tripping or something. And he was really ingenious. See this rod and this plate right here? He set this on top of the clapper inside the valve. This is a, a front view of it. Here's the top view of it. Here's that rod coming up. These Devise this little device with set screws that would, if that valve tried to trip, it would push it up tight against the top here, never allow that valve to operate. So 
I don't know how many years that system has been in service with the control valve wide open, everyone thinking that they had a system that was in operation, but it would have never operated. So just a word of caution there. And in summary here, I just wanted to stress a few things here again is sprinkler systems are installed because they're usually a code requirement. Um, and we have to make sure once they're installed that we use the appropriate and adopted inspection standards to test and maintain the systems. And the building owner or his designated representative is responsible for maintaining their fire protection system. You can hire that be done. You can have your own qualified people do it. Ultimately, it's that owner that's responsible. And then we, we only have to do the inspection and maintenance as a reasonable level of life safety. We want to make sure that that system will operate if it's needed. And then on the annual three and five years, make sure you use certified inspectors by the state at the appropriate level of certification for the system you have. Because if you got a level one, you know, doing a, a deluge system around a, a transformer, he's not qualified for that. You're liable at that point. So that being said, I, here's the last slide I get a kick out of. We took all of those rocks out of that supply line right there. So, you know, I, I just stress, um, you have to make sure this system is going to work. I know you don't want it, but I get it better work when it's called upon. So, any questions whatsoever? Well, I don't believe no questions. Thank you.